All right. How's it going, everyone? Thank you so much for joining us at the only show that asks you to pull out your chairs and get your TTRP RPG books and join us at the table. And thank you so much for your patience on this wonderful and really hot day. You know, every day sometimes is a trial. And that's what he, we as heroes are here to do is overcome those trials. So without further ado, let's introduce these two people, including the hardworking, mythical Mr. Michael Powell. Please tell them who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet. As PJ said, it was indeed a day today, and it continues to be. Well, I am Michael Powell, and you can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which is usually at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O, and how about you, PJ? My name is PJ McGaw. You can find me all over the internet at PJ.McGaw, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, which reminds me after this, I gotta make a quick Instagram post because I got some amazing dice from our friends at Waffles Maple Syrup. It's beautiful, uh, as well as uh, another little uh, surprise that we'll probably be showing on Thursday. But that being said, uh, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's take a deep breath and let's have fun talking about what we love to talk about. Yeah. Ooh. Now, if you haven't seen the last two episodes, we've been going into a deep, deep, deep dive uh, with classes. We've done some classes in the past, and if you like this system better, where instead of trying to put as much into one episode as we can, we're kind of taking our time and building that out a bit, let us know. We'd be more than happy to maybe eventually take requests and go back into older classes, maybe, if you ask politely. Mm -hmm. But today is part three on Sorcerers. We already covered the Bloodlines in depth. And if you haven't seen that, go check out episodes one and two. It's, I think they're on YouTube. If not, they will be soon. And this, this, this Sorcerer class can do almost anything. It's the most diverse casting class I've ever seen, in, yeah. especially as a Sorcerer. It's, mm -hmm. it's really good. Oh, yeah. It's honestly, I think this might end up being the class that we do the deepest dive in because honestly all, with all the bloodlines the the customization of the sorcerer is just while it's not endless it's very very deep it it is because not only are you handling like arcane spell casting to a, a very strong degree mm -hmm. you're also able of being a very strong um, backup healer, or maybe even a dedicated healer if you really want to go that route. Yeah. You can be a blaster caster, a defense caster, buffer, debuffer, crowd controller, social mage. Like, the sorcerer has no limitations, except yeah. for maybe tank, but you get some levels of dragon disciple, and that's not a problem. True, true. Um, I also believe that, uh, yeah, I think sorcerer is one of the spellcasting classes that has has the possibility to access every spell list. I believe so, depending on your choices and feats, because you mm. can definitely take, um, like, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, the Fey Ancestry, yeah. Ancestral Feat, and then get Primal Spell Casting. Mm. So you go Primal, Divine, Arcane, I don't know what could go, oh yeah. gosh, an Elven Sorcerer could easily do Occult mm. as well as Primal. I mean, the, uh, the Oracle and the Witch both classes, which we have uh, done deep dives on already, mm -hmm. they they kind of have the same, but it's they're more like skimming the surface while the sorcerer kind of plunges into the you know the deep end of the pool. Absolutely, yeah, and I think uh, that also kind of makes for interesting mechanics. Um, so yeah, so speaking of mechanics, we've gone over the bloodlines, and again, like especially the hag. If you remember the hag, that oh is... the hag, ooh. If you ever want to permanently ruin and debuff an NPC or a PC's character experience, play the Hag Bloodline. Mm-hmm. I'm still in pain from that. Honestly, but, I think the the Hag Bloodline is my favorite thus far. It's you know honestly, and here's the weird thing: just a, a, a quick retrospective before we go on with the the traits and feats, is the fact that everything they do that affects a character has a real chance of becoming a permanent spell effect. That's the thing. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd just be you know some some kind of debuff like crowd control, and that's fine. That's nice. We've seen that before, but it's the permanency that makes it devastating. Yeah, they're they're using the permanent sharpie. Ugh, I really really are. So today, after doing an amazing bloodline dive and initial proficiency dive, we're gonna try to finish the rest of the traits and get started on the mm -hmm. feats. Yeah. Um, 
so we've, we've done the bloodlines. If you want to see more about what these things can do and how crazy they are, go check that out. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial proficiencies, we did that back in episode one. Um, not going to no. spend too much time on yeah. that. And also, this is, I think, we've done the, you know, when we've done the other class deep dives, we did a little bit of here and there with the advanced uh, player's guide, but this one, we're going all in. So we're not just discussing what's in the core rulebook, we're also discussing what's in the advanced player's guide. True, very, very true. So we're going to try and give you as much detail as mm -hmm. possible, um, which is, again, another reason why these are so much more long form. Yeah. Um, and I want to touch a little bit on the sorcerer spellcasting. If you're also curious how the sorcerer differs from the mage versus the oracle, the cleric, and the witch. Mm -hmm. um, basically, uh, so, of course, this comes from your... Um, uh, bloodline, it says here that you can supply material, somatic, and verbal components when casting a spell, much like any other cast spell activity. Uh, but because you're a sorcerer, you can usually replace material components with somatic components. This is important. You don't actually have to, like, have the materials. You just do the gestures, and you get the spell. Mm -hmm. um, as well as being uh, a, I believe the spells are spontaneously cast as instead of prepared. Like, you still have to know the spells, yeah. but you can just kind of plug and play as you go. Um, and everything else is pretty standard. Charisma modifier, though, unlike mm -hmm. Wizard, which is intelligence, uh, you get a spell attack roll, spell DCs, um, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, heightened spells and cantrips still works here, same as every other caster. Um, and the cantrips and the heightened spells are really going to be your bread and butter, because if you want to go blaster caster, you know, having that eighth level, ninth level shocking grasp, oh, it's so good. Yeah. Oh man. Um, this next we have the spell repertoire. Uh, basically, this is just a collection of spells. Uh, first level, you learn two first level spells of your choice and four cantrips. So you're gonna learn two, but you can cast three a day at level one. Um, and also, you get cantrips from your bloodline and spells from your bloodline down the way. You can choose from these common spells from the, tra from the tradition corresponding to your bloodline or from other spells that a tradition to which you have access to would give. You can cast any spell in your spell repertoire by using a spell slab or corporate level. This is pretty much, we've seen this a million times. Yeah. Um, and again, because of the bloodline giving you access to that spell list and ancestry feats, everything else giving you access to others, there's really no limitation to what magic you can just call upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as a sorcerer, you're lucky enough that uh, you don't have to go from a spell book. You can actually just go, okay, um, I cast two spells from my spell list. They don't have to be pre-prepared. I can just choose which one at whatever time to cast them, which is super mm -hmm. useful, honestly. Absolutely, yeah. I, that's kind of what I like about the Sorcerer, besides just the powerful versatility of the bloodlines, giving you more than just this kind of Batman caster. You can be a Batman caster with these really powerful perks. You also have more freedom mm -hmm. in spell choice and spell casting. Um, I would not be surprised if looking in the feats at level one or two, we get a few materials, and then you don't need anything yeah. to cast spells. Um, now, the rest of this is pretty standard. Mm -hmm. You get skill feats at level two. Uh, for two levels thereafter, you get another skill feat. This is very, very good, especially for arcane casters. Like, if you get the arcane skill feat, besides being able to recognize magic, if you get, if you get your GM's approval, there's this level five uh, uh, skill feat where you get a magic eyeball, a third yeah. eye that you can open, mm -hmm. and it's so cool and yeah. pretty powerful for a skill-based uh, feat. Can, can I actually uh, backtrack a little bit because I want to really quickly talk about the there's one thing that a sorcerer is able to do with their spell repertoire is called swapping spells in your repertoire. The mm, one thing mm -hmm. about sorcerers is while they can cast whatever spells they want they don't have as extensive of a spell list like a wizard does. So yeah. what you need, what you could do though is, as you gain new levels, you could swap out what spells in your spell list that you want to know. Like, say at first level, um, you got Charm Person, but then when you level up to level five, you get some more spells. Maybe Charm Person's not doing it for you. You could choose something else. Swap it out. 
Yeah, and that's another thing I like because I know some editions, and I think the, and the other system does this too, where certain classes can swap spells out. Um, I hope one day to do a deep dive into wizards mm -hmm. as well because I would love to really have a juicy juxtaposition of wizard and sorcerer. They've always kind of been the two premier casters that are like head to head. Um, so I think I think yeah. after we do that, I'd love to do a comparison contrast episode. I will say this though: there is one thing about swapping your spells in your repertoire. You cannot swap out bloodline spells. That's the one thing. Yeah, and that makes sense because that is definitely a part of who you are. But also, it's free magic. So yeah. the way I look at it is like if you're getting free magic and it's mandatory, you keep it. I don't see anything wrong don't with that. Don't complain. So, yeah, don't complain about free magic. Free <laughs> I'm is making a, good, a Magus. Yeah. And they free are, is very good price. <laughs> free is, yeah. Let me tell you, playing a Magus is, is really interesting in this edition, but it's, it, 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 it's starved for spells, and there's a lot of really cool feats you can do for some really fun spell combinations. But uh, I decided to multi-class Paladin, so I don't get those abilities because I'm an idiot. But I'm going to smite real hard. Anyway, um, so skill feats. Sorcerer feats, you know, these are basically your class buildup. We're going to move that forward. Um, general feeds level three, every class gets this. Now you also get something called the signature spell, and this is interesting because this is a trait. Um, some some classes like the Magus, this is a feat you have to take, uh, and this you get pretty early. You've learned to cast some of your spells more flexibly. For each spell level you have access to, choose one spell of that level to be a signature spell. You don't need to learn heightened versions of signature spells separately. Instead, you can heighten these spells freely. You've learned a signature spell at a higher level than its minimum. You can also cast all its lower level versions without learning those separately. Wow, if you swap out a signature spell, you can choose a replacement signature spell of the same spell level of which you've learned the previous spell. So. Let's, let's put this in anime terms. Um, the Kamehameha. Goku is always going to have a spell slot for a Super Saiyan, Blue, Ultra Instinct, whatever madness he's doing. And he's got to junction those accordingly. But no matter what, no matter what spell level, whatever, he's always got a Kamehameha ready. And he can apply that Kamehameha anywhere on the spectrum of his spell slots. Um, so if he learns like a level 8 Kamehameha, he now, now, he now knows Kamehameha levels 1 through 8, and he doesn't have to prepare it. He can just kind of plug and play whenever he wants to do it. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, as uh, PJ said, kind of like that uh, in anime terms. It's also kind of like, okay, it's I want to cast a spell, but I want to maybe cast it at a lower level so I don't utterly turn something to ash like with a fireball. I just want to maybe singe him a little bit. You cast Spireball at a lower level. Absolutely. And that's another thing, too. It's, it's really great. Like, if you have that one signature spell, you're going to, like, if you're, that, if you're that Fireball Wizard, and we all know that Fireball Wizard, you just get so many Fireball bullets in your Fireball gun, mm -hmm. and you don't have to risk not having it prepared, losing spell slots for other important spells uh, along the way. So I really I, like the signature spell actually, feature. I would actually argue it's uh, it's actually not like Goku's uh, Kamehameha. It's more like uh, you, Yusuke Yurameshi from Yu Yu Hakusho's Spirit Gun. Because you could use a Spirit Gun as a regular big Spirit Gun or Spirit Shotgun, which shoots multiple smaller shots. Also a good anime reference. Mm -hmm. uh, first time chat, uh, your brand Dragon Dice... Signature key blast, uh, sort of, kinda, and we're just using this as a metaphor. Basically, it's just saying like signature spell, whatever spell you have, and you make that, and you make that your signature spell. Yeah, you can use that in every level up to the level you decide to learn it at. So, and you can swap that as you're leveling up. So you basically have this never-ending potential of like that one spell that you do really well. Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on. Um, let's see. We also have skill increases. Do you want to take that, uh, PJ? Of course, of course. Uh, skill increases. At third level and every two levels thereafter, you gain a skill increase. You can use this to increase, um, either become trained in a skill you are untrained in, or to increase your proficiency rank in a skill with which you already um, are trained, up to expert. At seven, this becomes master, and at 15, you can get legendary. Uh, it's very, very nice. The skill feats that play off these become 
delicious. A legendary athletics uh, skill feat called Cloud Jump lets you jump, I want to say, three times your jump to a maximum or approximate of 60 feet, vertical or long. Yeah, you're, wearing, you're, you're really wearing those Nikes. Yeah, you're getting all pumped up. Uh, so skill increase, a lot of fun. I also like this because unlike some, some things where the skill increases are incremental and kind of applies across the board, this one you kind of really get to pick and choose your custom skill mm -hmm. proficiencies. And it's very likely by level 20 you're going to have at least one or two legendary skills. Yeah. Unless you're an uh, investigator, I think you get a little more than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, investigators and rogues and bards, they're just sitting there like – drinking their skill juice with the pinky out like oh what's that don't mm. mind if i do be good at everything all right um want me to take a ability boost oh, pretty basic do. it's pretty yeah. basic every fifth level and every five level thereafter you get a boost on four different ability scores you can use these ability boosts to increase your ability scores above 18 and boosting an ability score increases it by one if it's already 18 or above or by two if it starts below 18 which means if you have a uh, a charisma score of 18, it's going to cost you two points instead of one. And you have a wisdom of 14, spend one uh, ability boost, and that's going to bump it up to 16. Yeah. I, you know, what's funny about this is that this was first introduced in Starfinder. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really glad they carried this over because one of the biggest problems with, like, the other system and earlier versions of the other system is that you only get one point every well like in 3.5 you only got one point every four or five levels i yeah. want to say and in the other system you get two points every four mm -hmm. but it's only to one stat or maybe plus one to two stats this is plus two to any four stats and that's extremely necessary yeah. because as you're playing if your wisdom uh, modifier isn't getting higher, you're going to fail perception checks, and you're going to definitely lose your willpower saves. Yeah. So uh, it's very important. In Pathfinder, combat can get really dangerous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I love throwing boss fights at my players for Edge of Legend because it's when I get to pull off the wheels sure. and just slap them. And they're, they're, we almost had a TPK on the the Mangle Maw fight. was almost a TPK yeah, at one yeah, point. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, Urban Dragon Dice uh, Investigator with their Legendary Perception. The funny thing about that is, at least with <laughs> me, for some reason, whenever we roll Perception for uh, Initiative, I always roll really, really low. Even though I think I have the highest Perception. I, I think you do. Uh, but just the fact that they have Legendary Perception, uh, Urban Dragon Dice, is insane if you think about it that's your level plus eight yeah without taking your wisdom modifier yeah. in and I, I i like to think of it as when rufa gets in a combat he actually this he purposely holds back to scan the battlefield that, that, that that's the reason why i roll low <laughs> yeah yeah. Also, uh, thank you, Michael, for correcting me. I think I said your brand, Dragon Dice, before Urban Dragon Dice. Mm -hmm. I love that name. Uh, thank you for the correction. Um, and also Urban Dragon Dice, thank you for correcting me as well. Names are important. I believe a name is who you are, and that's why I have to get it correct. Uh, so we have Ancestry Feats after Ability Boosts. Um, pretty straightforward. You get another feat from your Ancestry list of feats, which I like that more added power. Mm -hmm. Magical Fortitude, the last thing at level 5. This is basically a Fortitude save increase to Expert. Um, and this is kind of nice because most casters be squishy. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it's weird that it comes at level 5, but I mm. get it. It's coming at yeah. level 5 because they're trying to show that your priority should not be Fortitude saves can, as a caster. Can I just say something really quick? It might be slightly off-tangent, but mm -hmm. I always felt that Sorcerers... Their uh, spellcasting score should have been Constitution instead of Charisma. I agree with you 100% on that. And, and I know why it's Charisma. Because, yeah. you know, the way they look at, like, the, the power and the blood is more like a, like a force of will on the universe. Mm -hmm. But I also like the idea of a Constitution caster because we don't have that. Yeah. You know, in, in the other system, we have three or four Charisma casters if you, cl if you include Paladins mm -hmm. as casters. Um, 
so it's done to death. Why not have a constitution? And then it's, it's all about like how hardy your physical body is as opposed to how hardy your personality in the cosmos is. Yeah. Especially if you have something called bloodlines. Just saying. Yeah. Oh, Ur, uh, Urban Dragon Dice mentioned the reason why sorcerers use charisma is so they also get skill synergy. And that's a very valid argument, too. Like having a caster who actually has face skills, who's not the bard, or not just the bard, I should say, is also very valuable. Especially when you consider, I want to say up until 3.0 or 3.5, charisma is always the dump stat. Mm. No one respected charisma as a stat because they were like, I can just talk my way in character out of these situations and my role isn't going to affect that. Um, but then they started making charisma a stat that actually had roles and you know, yeah. things that were important. And I think that's when they realized we also have to add charisma of like casters and fighters and things. Yeah, but you know, like I said, bards. Bards already have that. Yeah, I'm just saying, I think it'd be cool if there was a feat, an optional feat, that let you um, choose between your charisma or your con, whatever's mm -hmm. higher, and then you get to have a charisma or con build. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, moving on, we have Expert Spellcaster. I'm going to take this, all right, PJ? Do it. This is at level 7. Your inherent magic responds easily and powerfully to your command. Your proficiency rank for spell attack rolls and spell DCs for spells of your bloodline tradition increases to Expert, which means you cast spells. You're a better caster. Essentially, you're just a better caster. You get from, a, I think, a plus two to a plus four, I want to say? Yep. I mean, hey, if you, no matter how you look at it, it's a higher spell DC, yep. and it's a higher bonus to hit with spells. Um, and this is really, really good, because, like, class DCs generally are not going to scale as well as, like, caster DCs will. Mm -hmm. And uh, not a lot of casters get really high, at least from what I've seen. And I'm really, I'm really just kind of, like, milking from the, the Magus... Uh, who at level 15 ends on expert. Uh, so it's always good. It's always yeah. going to get better DCs and better bonuses to hitting with spells, uh, spell attacks. Um, lightning reflexes and alertness. I can play hit this back to back. Yeah. Lightning reflexes. Your reflexes are now expert. Uh, alertness. Your perception is now expert. Boom. Done. And Done. then weapon exp expertise. Your proficiency rank in simple weapons and unarmed attacks increases to expert at level 11. And I believe mm -hmm. I could do defensive robes as well, since it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, yeah. Level 13, your proficiency rank in unarmored defense increases to expert. So, well, you're better at dodging and taking hits while not wearing those armor. Yup, yup. Uh, and this was kind of funny. Again, I think this is there to kind of show the scaling for balance, but weapon specialization, not greater weapon specialization, just normal weapon spec, kicks in at level 13, which gives you additional melee damage uh, for free, just stacks on. Two, if you are trained with something. Three, no, I'm sorry, two if you're expert. Three, if you are a master. And four, if you are legendary. This is also to help kind of you know, adjust to how difficult the other creatures are getting. Yeah. Your fighter classes are going to get um, weapon spec, I want to say, around level 5 to 7 and mm -hmm. greater between, like, 9 and 15. Yeah. I, I like to think of this as, by level 13, your spellcaster just knows where to shank somebody. <laughs> yeah, and obviously, I'm not going to... I'm not going to say optimization is always the goal. Sometimes fun and, and mm -hmm. character concept is, but... This is kind of there to show you that if you are going to play a sorcerer, you really shouldn't mm -hmm. be picking up a, a club and, and fighting someone. You, you absolutely can. Yeah. But, you're, but the fighter is going to just, just embarrass you on that front. Uh, Urban Dragon Dice posted, Magus feels like the cleric. Yeah, it kind of does. It kind of does feel like a little bit like a arcane version of a cleric with a very, very limited spell list. Absolutely. It does feel like like the warrior priest cleric. You know, I feel you on that one. Uh, because it's something that's got a, a you know, a decent potency of spells and physical buffs and abilities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's basically a, I kind of actually want to say, uh, more contra version of a blaze singer from the other uh, system. Very much so. It, you know, it's funny too, because like, it also kind of 
and I see why people are saying this. It, it, the, the, also the, spit out PJ. The spell slot progression feels similar to the Warlock in Five E. In fact, yeah. if that other system, if you like, if you like the Warlock, especially the Hex Blade, which I'm sure almost everyone mm-hmm. does from that system, highly recommend using the Magus as a bridge to this system and all the crazy things you can do therein. I would actually argue, yeah. I would agree and argue with saying yes if you're going for like a warlock hexblade, but if you're mm-hmm. going for a spellcaster warlock warlock, I would say go with um sorcerer hag bloodline, sorcerer diabolic headline, uh bloodline or sorcerer one of the basically one of the demonic bloodlines. Oh, a thousand percent no. If you want to be to use the language from the other system, uh Pact of the Tome Warlock, mm-hmm. go sorcerer. You're gonna get everything you want and more. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a Hexblade and slashy, slashy, casty, casty, mm-hmm. go Magus, and you're not going to be yeah. disappointed, especially because cause I've been making a Magus for this charity game, and I've been really pouring over the playtest mm-hmm. materials. There's a fun combo, and please someone correct me if I'm wrong. Get in the chats, you legends, and correct me. But there's a level... I uh, forgot the feats. I want to say level 4 and level 6, or level 6, level 8 feat combo. One is called Martial Caster, mm-hmm. which just gives you free spells. Now, they're all utility and buff spells, but they give you free spell slots to cast these spells. And then you can take these signature spell feet, not trait, that lets you make one spell, your signature spell, and you can use all spell slots to cast it spontaneously. Meaning, if I'm right with this combo, you can use these haste and buff only spell slots to now cast more attack magic. Yeah. Um, really quick, uh, jump in and chat, uh, Urban Dragon Dice posted Spell Strike equals buff cleric ki- build, kinda, and then, mm-hmm. which is closer to the caster warlock in theme? Eh, I guess, it could be. But I also still argue Sorcerer would, would, Sorcerer from the core, you know, rule book. Yeah. I definitely see the theme, the idea of a patron. In fact, the witch and the warlock both, both use a patron, for mm-hmm. sure. The witch is different mechanically i think we could agree upon that yeah. uh also back to the sorcerer urban dragon dice previously said i think it'd be i think it would have been better to figure out the sorcerer's origin and how that would change the primary yeah. stat mm. the casting bit i think that's also a really cool idea because a yeah. demonic caster mm-hmm. or, or a diabolic caster for sure is charisma yeah and i would actually say uh which would be if you want to have the pack that allows you to have familiar which is i believe called pact of the chain that would be which. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, let's yeah. uh, continue on. Uh, the next one I'll take is uh, at level 15. It's called Master Spellcaster. And your proficiency ranks in spell attack rolls and DCs increase the master. So you're an even better spellcaster. More DCs, more bonus to hit with spell attacks. And since this is your bread and butter, it should. You mm-hmm. should be getting this ability. Um, let's make a note, because I, I, when we do this, eventually, if the chat wants us to do wizard, I would love to do wizard, mm-hmm. and I really want to do compare and contrast of wizard and sorcerer. Um, but that being said, next up is resolve. Basically, your will save is now a master uh, proficiency, uh, and it's good old-fashioned, if, uh, if you roll a success, it's a crit instead. Now, I love this because you get that free, you know, if you hit, you crit kind of uh, mm-hmm. vibe. It seems a little weird to me, though, because I want to say we've run into this with other classes that had this much earlier. Mm-hmm. It seems kind of weird to me that their will save would take this long to get a, a, an upgrade, and this is the only ability that they're allowed to get a crit. crit um, I, I that's think a crit success. it's because of the whole spell casting thing, kind of want to say. It might be. Yeah. You might be right, and it's not yeah. a bad idea because I think like sorcerers start off with um, an expert in will saves, uh, so they probably are just using all the other levels to mm-hmm. catch the other two saves up to the primary save. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, at level nineteen, you get Bloodline Paragon. Uh, let's see. Let's see what it says. Uh, you have perfected the magic in your bloodline. Add two common tenth level spells of your tradition to your repertoire, you gain a single 10th level spell slot you can use to cast these spells using sorcerer spellcasting. Unlike other spell slots, you don't get more 10th level spells as you level up, and they can't be used for abilities that let you cast spells without expanding spell slots or abilities that give you more spell slots. 
you can also take the Bloodline Perfection Sorcerer feat to gain a second slot. God magic. I yeah. love it. Uh, really quick, let's check out what Bloodline Perfection is. Really, It's really short. It's a feat that you typically get at level 20. Uh, you command the ultimate powers of your Bloodline and Tradition. You gain an additional 10th level spell slot. So, you know, if you wanted to cast a god level wish, not even the level 9 wish, the god, no, no, I'm sorry, this edition wish is a 10th level spell. Uh, you can cast wish twice a day now. Yeah. With that feat. That's worth it. Yeah. Uh, hope your uh, GM is, uh, has that monkey paw ideas ready. Uh, man, oh, man. Or just something to kind of be like, okay, in case they cast wish, I'm just going to have to wing it. Okay. Um... And last but not least, your last trait that you get for this class, level 19, is your legendary spellcaster. And this makes absolute sense for being the capstone, because now it's a plus 8, plus level to your DC saves and your bonuses hit with spell attacks. It's the most logical conclusion. And really the only thing you that like makes sense at this point to get. Yeah. All right. Which means then uh, we're going into feats. Finally getting this feats. Haha. <laughs> All right, do you want to kick it off, or should I? I'll kick it off really fast. The first one is Ancestral Ancestral Blood Magic. Make sure I hit that A-N sound. The magic of your bloodline mixes with that of your ancestry. You gain a blood magic effect when you cast a non-cantrip spell you gained from a heritage or an ancestry feat, in addition to the normal circumstances that trigger your blood magic. This is really cool, because if you are an elf uh, character, um, or any number of the geniekin or elemental blooded types that you're, you're for sure going to get a spell like ability or maybe even access to a spell directly. Mm -hmm. The fact that you can use that to trigger the blood magic effect means you now have more opportunities to use this really cool, really useful free effect. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I like to, Think of it as that free uh, bloodline effect as uh, the seasoning on your uh, steak. Yeah. Um, Urban Dragon Dice. Sorcerers are some of the most customizable casters, at least thematically. Changeling Hag, too. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, go back and watch the Bloodline 2 parter because there's just so much you can do yeah. with these guys. All right. Um, next up is Blessed Blood. It's a first level feat. And the prereq for this is the bloodline. You have to ha have ah, you have to be in a bloodline that grants divine spells. Like uh, I think it's the I think it's literally called divine bloodline, right? Uh, you get celestial, diabolic, and I want to say demonic are all yeah. divine oh, bloodlines. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and you also follow a deity. Your deity's blessings manifest in your bloodborne power. Add up to three of your deity's spells, spells that your deity grants to clerics to your spell list. They are not automatically added to your repertoire, but you can select them as you would spells normally on the divine spell list. Which is actually really interesting because if you go with that divine spell list, there are some deities, at least raw as written, uh, those gods have, uh, I think some of these gods are arcane gods that you might get be able to, you know, dip your toe in a little bit of uh, arcane spells or primal, even. Yeah, absolutely. That That's awesome because once again, with one feat, you can now potentially step into you know, three or four different yeah. uh, uh, sources of magic. I love that. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up is a reaction feat called Counterspell. We all know Counterspell, it's awesome. And what I like about this is it's not really a spell. It's a feat that you get that lets you use the counterspell action. Mm. So let's go further into this. Counterspell reaction. Uh, the requirements for this version is a sorcerer. You have an unexpended spell slot you can use to cast a triggering spell. Trigger. A creature casts a spell that you have prepared. When a foe casts a spell and you can see its manifestations, you can use your own magic to disrupt it. Uh, and there's some variations. This is kind of cool. There's some variations depending on the class and how this works. For example, the sorcerer, since that we're talking about. You can expend one of your spell slots to counter the triggering creature's casting of a spell that you have in your rep repertoire. You lose your spell slot, so, I'm sorry, as if you had cast the triggering spell. 
then you attempt to counteract the triggering spell. There's a special thing for sorcerers. This feat has a trait corresponding to the tradition of the spells you cast, Arcane, Divine, Occult, or Primal. So uh, I believe you have to either already know the spell or the spell has to be a type of which your bloodline is yeah, attributed Yeah, I believe with. for sorcerers, um, they don't have to know the exact spell, but they have to know from the... They have, the spell that they basically sacrifice to counter the spell has to be of the same uh, spell list as the spell that's being cast. Yeah. Now, this may be interpreted on logic or on language. If your GM says, no, it has to be the spell exactly, okay, that's, that's what that is, but that's something you can talk about. I kind of like the latter of the two, where it has to be within your bloodline, mm -hmm. because it, it, everything you do is related to that. You're literally yeah. using your dominance of your... I, magical source in your blood I, to shut that spell off. I think it is as written how you described it latter for the sorcerer. But if you're like a witch or a wizard, which is a prepare spell caster, you have to know literally the same spell they're casting. Yeah, it says here, if you go witch and wizard uh, and you want to use counter spell, you expend a prepared spell to counter the triggering creature's casting of that same spell. Yeah, so this can become kind of iffy because if you have prepared Fireball and they are casting Earthquake, those are way farther apart in level, but just humor me on this, mm -hmm. then you cannot stop the Earthquake. You mm -hmm. can only stop the Fireball. And that's kind of disappointing. Yeah. But considering that this is a free feat and not a spell you have to learn, and you can just pick and choose the spell slots as they are prepared. I mean, yeah. it is for sure stronger than the Sorcerer. Let's just put that out yeah. there right now. I'm just going to say um, it's a, it's so much better for the Sorcerer, I agree. And let's see. I just want to double-check something. You expand a prepare spell slot. Yeah, yeah. It, it works so much better for the Sorcerer. At least it is to the way I understand it. If... Um, if you know if any of the, what do you call it, the designers of the game mm -hmm. says otherwise, let us know. Yes. Correct as is always. Real legends can take, uh, like, optimi not optimistic, uh, helpful criticism. Mm -hmm. um, so, and also, as a GM, you can make a house yeah. rule on that. Like me, I'm totally okay with all of the casting classes just having it be a part of their school doctrine. Like, yeah. you would you would be able to shut down Arcane Spell if you're a smart enough Arcane Wizard. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I think it should have been like that across the board. I mm -hmm. think. At least that's how yeah. I feel. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, the next level one feat is called Dangerous Sorcery. Your legacy grants you great destructive power. When you cast a spell from your spell slots, if the spell deals damage and doesn't have a duration, you gain a status bonus to that spell's damage equal to the spell's level. This is... It's a small bonus, but uh, it could really build up. It absolutely could really build up. And what I like about this is that this is also a way to get bonus damage to spells mm -hmm. like well, like Shocking Grasp, like Fireball, like all the big blaster ones. Uh, what do you um, call it? Um, days. Days is a cantrip. I, I had to look at that really carefully because it says here, when you cast a spell from your spell slots... Ah, you're right. Because at first, yeah, I was right there with you. I was like, you mean I get to buff my cantrips more? Mm -hmm. No. That's no, it's dark. only your slotted spells, 1 to 10. But I would love if that could work for yeah. cantrips. Dear yeah. God, that would just Ooh, break that was cantrips. So good. That would be so good. But anyway, oh. uh, moving on. Do you want to take familiar, PJ? Sure, sure. Familiar. You get a familiar. Yeah, you get a little buddy. <laughs> you or, get a buddy. Yeah. I think uh, according to uh, Edge of Legend, our show on Wednesdays, you get <laughs> a friendly badger. <laughs> yeah, you get an emotional support familiar. Um, and uh, yeah, familiars are, are really cool. If you like to have a magical pet, you can also in this system customize them. So yeah, you'll take a stat block, but you can give them new powers, new abilities, new personalities. And familiars aren't like animal companions. Like, they really shouldn't be physically fighting. Yeah. But they are a great extension of your magical ability and reach and yeah. everything. As a spellcaster, I love using my familiar as a scouting tool. Because I believe, uh, I'm not sure, either you could, it's one of their abilities, or it's a feat that you grant to them, but you could actually see through your familiar's eyes. 
Yeah, that's definitely one of the abilities that generally tends to come about. Um, I also like the the touch spell thing. Mm -hmm. So, like, again, I love Shocking Grass because I love just dropping 5d10 lightning damage mm -hmm. um, at, like, level 2 or second level casting. So imagine, like, a little baby owl lands on this one, this one person's shoulder and then just activates your level 2 Shocking Grass for, like, 3 to 5d10 lightning. It's like, ha <laughs> my bird just killed you. Yeah, or um, I believe you could do this by... Uh... It's not really flanking, but you could you could send your familiar behind an enemy and have them cast uh, through them a spell, a touch spell or something. Absolutely. Uh, Urban Dragon Dice says, unless you build a fighting, I believe that's supposed to be greater familiar, that's a very specific build. That is. It's very, very specific, and it's, it's definitely one of those builds that you're going to have to work really hard to, to kind of put, or at least kind of work against. Yeah all of the other options to deploy it. But it's doable. It's absolutely yeah, doable. Yeah. All right. Our next uh, feat is called uh, Reach Spell. It's one action. You could extend the range of your spells. If the next action you use is to cast a spell that has range, increase that spell's range by 30 feet. As a standard for increasing spell ranges, if the spell normally has a, re uh, has a range of touch, you can extend its reach to 30 feet. Uh, this... Actually, this is one of my favorite, uh, I guess you could call it meta magic uh, feats, because using this on touch spells is just, it's great. And also, another reason why I like Pathfinder 2nd Edition for its three-action economy. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and it makes, it's weird, because I know, like, it's a little sad, because meta magic has always been another one of the things that made sorcerers so unique, being able to craft and change the magic on the go. Mm -hmm. But I definitely like and appreciate how this ability has opened up meta magic to all classes. And as a cleric, it's just any touch spell. So if you want to take a two action casting of heal, which is really strong, and then it put an extra action in it so you can basically heal someone for huge bonuses 30 feet in front of you. Yeah, it's, you it's great. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot more beneficial than doing the huge AOE heal that won't mm -hmm. heal as strong you can really just heal the tank from 30 feet away. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Uh, I li Actually, I like ca calling those characters, which are a combination of uh, buffer, debuffer, healing, that stays in the background with the spell. I call them operators or tacticians. I, I like that. I like that. Um, the next feat is called Widen Spell. Talking about those metamagic operators. Mm -hmm. uh, you manipulate the energy of a spell, causing it to spread out and affect a wider area. If the next action you use is to cast a spell that has the area of a burst cone or line, and it does not have a duration, increase the area of that spell. Add five feet to the radius of a burst that normally has a radius of at least ten. Um, a burst with a smaller radius, however, will not be affected. Add five feet to the length of a cone or line that is normally 15 feet long or smaller and add 10 feet to the length of a larger cone or line. So that 30-foot cone that most spells will give off is now going to be a 40-foot cone. Mm. And as it extends out, that 10 feet is really going to cover a yeah. lot of ground. Geometry, folks. Or uh, Oh, the best way I can describe it is how Captain America or even Cyclops knows where to either throw the throw the shield or uh, optic blast to have it bounce off this area to that area to this area. Trig. It's uh it's what they do with uh, expert level uh, pool players. Yeah, I'm I'm terrible at it. That's why uh, I don't play pool. <laughs> All right. Ooh, anoint ally. Yeah. What's this? This is a level 2 feat, one action. You forge a mystical connection with an ally using your body as a focus, allowing them to benefit from your magic. You place a blood rune on an adjacent ally that lasts for one minute. When you would cast a blood magic effect, you can forego it, granting it to your ally instead. You can anoint only one ally at a time. If you place another rune, your previous destination ends. So, um, yeah. Sorcerers have these uh, blood magic abilities that, uh, as we said before, it's basically the season, a little extra seasoning on top of uh, the spell that you just cast. That gives you usually a special bonus or a debuff on your enemy. Sometimes it's only to you, but if you have this feat and ability, you can grant it to, to your uh, allies instead of yourself. Yeah, it's, it's really cool. Like, when you cast any of those... 
uh, normally it's a benefit either you or the enemy has to take. Instead, you can just like buff the, the tank the whole time or buff the healer if you want to be like a celestial bloodline and just really uh, amp them up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, Eric Jackson mentions that the uh, meta magics to make a thing wider or has a reach is a little less useful if you run Theater of the Mind. That's true. Mm -hmm. When we do Edge of Legends, we try to do Theater of the Mind. Uh, our goal is to eventually do some stuff in the studio. We have a few picked out, uh, and that might change some things out. So my yeah. rule of thumb as a GM for Theater of the Mind is always put people in distances mm -hmm. of uh, zero to 30 mm -hmm. foot increments, so 30, 60, et cetera, I so mean, that these things still kind of have yeah. an effect. I mean, I still I would still say that Reach Spell would be useful with Theater of Mind, meaning for a fact that it grant it turns your touch spells into range spells. Also true. Also true. Yeah. Um, let's see. Cantrip expansion is the next feat. This is very simple. It gives you uh, two more cantrips. If you are a prepared caster, cleric, wizard, etc., you can prepare two additional cantrips each day. If you are a spontaneous caster, then you just get two more cantrips. Yeah. It, it's it's free magic, and in this game, cantrips has so much Ooh. more weight to them. Yeah, I, 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 I love, love that. I love cantrips. Like, honestly, at this point, I think my favorite is... I, I said it before, I think my favorite at this point is Days. Yeah, I, I gave Days the Magus that I'm doing this, this uh -huh. charity for, so, like, I'm looking forward to casting Days off of a strike. Yeah. Oh, uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, um, our next level two feat is Enhanced Familiar. Prereq is... You have, a, have, you have to have a familiar, which makes sense. Um, you infuse your familiar with additional magical energy. You can select four familiar or master abilities each day instead of two. Uh, there's a special if it's for wizard or witch, which I believe uh, I think we've gone over in the witch video, and we're probably going to go over in the wizard video when we do it. So we'll do it when we do it. Uh, let's see... Uh, there's also a thing called archetype use. This feat can be used for one or more archetypes in addition to a list of classes. When selected this way, the feat is not considered to have its class traits. Yeah, so the, the archetype use is mostly, at this point, a reference to the familiar master archetype, mm -hmm. um, which also gives you the enhanced familiar ability or in some way um, works with it. So you're going to see that a lot in some of these feats. Um, there'll be a reference to another archetype or thing mm -hmm. that uses or influences this feat. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Entreat with Forebears. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, prereqs, a bloodline that corresponds with a creature trait. So, like, aberrant. Um, something about your presence causes creatures of your bloodline to, consciously or not, recognize you as one of their own and you become inured to their tricks. You gain a plus one circumstance bonus to diplomacy, deception, and intimidation checks while interacting with creatures that have the trait corresponding to your bloodline. And you get a plus one circumstance bonus to perception and saving throws against such creatures. For example, yeah, they took mine, an aberrant bloodline sorcerer would gain this benefit against the creatures of an aberrant trait. Mm. The GM is the final arbiter of which creatures match your bloodline. So if they're doing some weird stuff and they're creating like an aberrant dragon for stat reasons or whatever, they can rule out, yeah, it may be aberrant, but it's still a dragon. Basically, it's like, no, it's a boss. Screw you. You can't do this. Um, but those are some yeah. suggestions. I would actually say this is actually useful when you take a hag because, ooh, hags are... Hags are a pain, especially they, since they have access to so many spells that attack your saving throws. Absolutely. Heck, aberrants, because aberrants are constantly attacking your willpower saves, mm. your fortitude saves. Um, they're just terrifying monstrosities. Yeah. Dragons, too, because let's not, like, go easy in that fire breath, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All right, our next level four feat is called Arcane Evolution. Prereq is a bloodline that grants arcane spells. Your arcane legacy grants you an exceptional aptitude for intellectual and academic pursuits. You become trained in one skill of your choice. Additionally, you keep a book of arcane spells similar to a wizard's spellbook. You add all the spells in your spell repertoire to the 
to this book for free and you can add additional arcane spells to the book by paying the appropriate cost and using your arcana skill similarly to how a wizard can learn spells to add these spells to their spell book during your daily preparations choose any one spell from your book of arcane spells if this isn't in your spell repertoire add it to your spell repertoire until the next time you prepare if it's already in your spell repertoire add it as additional signature spell for that day that last line that last yeah half of the sentence is what makes this level four feat so powerful mm -hmm. not only are you and i say this word very usually loosely uh multi-classing sorcerer wizard at this point but now um only in the idea that you can get a spell book and actually like basically ingest more spells to your list of knowledge uh but now you get to have bonus uh spontaneous casting signature spells you can you know besides what you're already doing you get like an extra one a day from this book so if it's not one that you normally prepare from your blood or yeah. anything else screw it i'm doing it anyway <laughs> yeah. and also on top of all that you also gain a you're trained in another spell uh another uh skill of your choice Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. just the frosting. That's and that's really, really cool. Because uh, just the more skills, the better. Now, I'll say this. This does really depend upon your bloodline, and if you really want to go that route. Um, Imperial bloodline, dragon bloodline, mm -hmm. these are all arcane bloodlines. Um, I want to say the elemental one is primal. I might be wrong. Yeah. But either way, like if you really want to be just a dummy thick sorcerer with a just with a, a huge knowledge base definitely take this one yeah imperial bloodline the imperial one is one dragon one is mm -hmm. arcane i don't know if the elemental one is either arcane or, L or uh primal. i think it's arcane Prim well either way um next up bespelled weapon um i'm yeah this is funny this is the exact same thing that the magus gets mm -hmm. um it's a free action. Once per turn, your most recent action was to cast a non-cantrip spell. You siphon the residual energy from your last spell that you cast into one weapon you're wielding. I love the, the mental image of that fluff. Until the end of your turn, this weapon deals an extra 1d6 damage of a type depending on the school you just cast. So really, it's going to be a free 1d6, um, the the flavor of which is dependent upon the spell. So if you cast an abjuration spell and like cast shield or anything, well shield to cantrip, but any abjuration spell to protect and buff you, now your next attack has one d six force damage, and that's great no matter who you are. Yeah, and uh, if you cast daze, it's a uh, free damage on uh, mental damage. Absolutely, or at least a non cantrip version of yeah, daze yeah. would have that effect. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, right sorry. That's all right. And now, conjuration transmutation is interesting because it's the same type as the weapon, uh, which reminds me of the war priest oh, no. from the other game where your divine basically blesses your weapon to just be more weapon than a weapon. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had a normal hammer. Now I have a hammer. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So we did be spell divine evolution. Oof. Mm. Love that divine bloodline. What you got for me? It's a level four feet. Prereq is a bloodline that grants divine spells. The divine might provided by your bloodline flows through you. You gain an additional spell slot of your highest level, which you could use only to cast a spell of harm or heal. Yes. You can cast either of these spells using that spell slot, even if they aren't in your repertoire. I love that. You gain an additional spell slot. You, you get a free casting that doesn't yeah. go against your spells per day. Oh, that's that's like, it's like a slightly neutered version of the Divine Font, but considering how awesome Divine Font is, I will take that. Yeah, and also I believe, um, yeah, this the fact that uh, you get, you're gonna get a lot of feats that will grant you additional spell slots as a sorcerer, and you could stack these. Yeah, I think so. But what's great about this is that, like, you know, if you're going celestial or diabolic or mm -hmm. you know demonic, whatever you want to go through. You know, one of the issues you're going to have, as we said in the last episode or two episodes ago, is kind of juggling, you know, your your offensive sorcerer-based magic with your divine healing, damaging, you know, buffing magic mm -hmm. or whatever. So, you know, you're, if you if you want to be the celestial and play the off healer, you have to juggle playing the healer and playing whatever you would normally do with a sorcerer. 
this at least makes it one step easier. So if you want to yeah. go celestial, celestial as a as a main healer or off healer, get divine evolution. It is so good. Mm, yeah. Uh, why don't you take a elaborate flor flourish? Elaborate flourish. Ooh, a meta magic feat. Oh, I love this. You embellish your spell casting with entrancing flourishes and grand pronouncements, making it harder to identify or counter. If the next action you use is to cast a spell, creatures with the ability to cast that spell don't automatically know what it is. In addition, creatures that witness your spell casting take a negative two circumstance penalty to checks to identify the spell with recall knowledge and checks to counteract that spell uh, during its casting, such as with a counter spell feat. So this basically is a defensive feat to stop you from having your spell countered or having your spell found out. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to work as much with the GM. Uh, I don't know how much the GM is going to really try to yeah. like earn that for themselves. You know, I feel like most GMs would just I go, mean, I know what this spell is, I'll just, I'll just go from there. I'm going to say this, if Rufa was a spellcaster, this would just be Rufa adding um, bullshit hand gestures. <laughs> Random BS gestures, go! Ah! Which is basically I, this. <laughs> I, I I love that gesture. I, I kind of like this because that is kind of like the I'm just winging it of feats. You know, you're like, oh, I'm going to cast Fireball. I, I don't know how to cast Fireball. Um, um, fireball! And, and then it happens, you're like, oh, oh, snap. Oh, God, it's that, it's that uh, Moon Knight meme. Random bullshit, go! <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was saying. Love that. <laughs> All right. Um, next up is the occult evolution. Uh, it's a level four feet. Prereq is a bloodline that grants occult spells. Glimpses of the obscure secrets of the universe loan you your power. You become trained in one skill of your choice. Additionally, once per day, you can spend one minute to cast. Oh, one minute to choose one mental occult spell you don't know and add it to your repertoire. You lose this temporary spell the next time you make your daily preparations. Though you can use this ability to add it again later. So, it's like arcane. It's like the arcane one. You get a free spell slot. Well, now this is interesting because I'm trying to go over the the wording here. Because it says once per day you can spend one minute to choose one spell you don't know and oh, add yeah. it to your repertoire. Ah. This is a little different because basically instead of getting the free spell slot, you're getting free spell knowledge. Oh, you're so, right, you're right. Yeah. So if you didn't learn a specific spell at your level and you later find out this spell is like heckin' good, you can use this ability to always have this ability learned. And then you could prepare it sure. with your spells. Well, you it, know, prepare spells. It's kind of you know like I mean. uh, before you level up to swap out your spells in your spell repertoire, which is the ability that sorcerers do get. Mm -hmm. So before you make that choice, you could be like, okay, uh, this is basically one of those GM says no, nah, no, this rule actually, this, this ability lets me do this. Yeah, it, it's very good for when, let's say you're leveling, you're level four, you're picking new spells. And you swap out some old ones, and you're like, oh, I, I don't know if I want to get rid of these spells because this new one is good, and this one, I don't know if I can... Like, I'll know I'll need it, but I don't, I don't know when I'll need it. Yeah. That, you know, that kind of challenge we yeah. all have. This feat allows you to effectively forget that spell, learn the new one, and then every day decide if you want to continue having that older spell or a new spell that you just didn't get the chance mm. to pick up yet. But it still has to be a mental occult spell. Yes, absolutely. Either way, it's really good for giving you... It diversifies your portfolio, son. There you go. And also, you're training one additional skill of your choice. Always good. More skills. Get it. Uh, next up, we have the primal evolution. Um... I have a feeling it's probably similar to the last one. Bloodline that grants primal spells is the prereq for this feat. You can call upon the creatures of the wild for aid. You gain one additional spell slot of your highest level, which you can use to cast summon animal or summon plants or fungus. You can cast either of these spells using that spell slot, even if they aren't in your spell repertoire. I'd say this is actually stronger, because instead of having spell flexibility, it's a free spell. Full-on free spell. Mm -hmm. Now, granted... 
you have to use it for only summon animal or plants and fungus. But this saves you that hassle as a druid, if that was the case, or in this case, a druid wannabe sorcerer. You don't have to worry about prepping that spell. Now you just have it for free once yeah. a day. Just, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, actually, I think of all the evolutions, uh, the occult one, I feel, is the one that's most lacking. Well, I think it really depends on the... Uh, what's what I'm looking for? The, the juice and the squeeze here. The Divine Evolution, in my opinion, is... It's, it's amazing. It's tremendous. Um, but what the Occult Evolution does is, since most mind spells are going to be attacks or crowd control or debuffs that are very potent, it's, instead of giving you a free one, it's giving you flexibility. So if you're like, oh, okay, well, this, this spell doesn't work against like the area we're going to go into. Instead, I'm going to use this Occult Evolution spell to just pull up another more powerful telekinetic projectile or something. Fair. I, um, I, yeah, fair. I just feel that um, that versus Arcane Evolution, Arcane Evolution would kind of went out because you get the whole spell book thing. True. I mean, for sure, if you can ever just get a legitimately, a legitimately free spell slot to some degree that's always going to feel better. Yeah. I think the occult evolution is first of all all these all these feats are good. Maybe on the list of if we had to like cure the evolutions, the occult might be lower yeah. towards the bottom. Uh, arcane and divine evolutions for sure are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Not gonna not gonna knock them down. Yeah. Anyway, uh, next. Up, we have a meta magic uh, ability called Split Shot. It's a level four. Uh, it's a level four feat. You fragment a range spell into a pair of smaller shots. If your next action is cast a spell without a duration that requires a attack roll against a single target and has no effect beyond dealing damage, you roll a single attack roll and compare the result to the DC. I mean AC of two targets within the spell's range. The spell deals only half its usual damage to each target. This counts as one attack for your multiple attack penalty. So, remember, like, way back before when I said, uh, it's kind of like Yusuke Yurameshi's uh, spirit shotgun? Mm -hmm. This is literally the spirit shotgun. Yeah, it's like Maynard was saying. He, well, he's, he said some things in the chat that I thought were funny. I'm not going to say them out loud. You can probably scroll up and see it. Uh, and let us know if you don't approve but yeah no very much like that and i kind of like this because it uh solves the problem of having a like a powerful ray spell mm -hmm. uh and you're like oh but i really gotta hit more than one person well now i can oh yeah Let's see next up uh why don't you take advanced Ooh. bloodline Advanced Bloodline. If you're here for the Bloodline episode, then you know this goes directly into that. You have studied your Bloodline to learn the secrets of its magic. You gain the Advanced Bloodline spell associated with your Bloodline. Increase the number of focus points in your focus pool by one. Now, for those who don't know about focus uh, points and focus spells, you can get three focus points maximum. Uh, you, it, you have to take ten minutes to refocus to get one focus point back. Um... And these, these are really cool. These are basically like free powers that your bloodline gives you. You get spells for that bloodline and these bloodline spells. So you have to take the feat or else you won't get that free power. Yeah. And some of the advanced bloodlines are actually really, really good. Yeah. Like they scale yeah. and they scale so hard. Yeah. Um, so I really would recommend doing that. I'm sure these other level six feats are going to be great, but Odds are it's going to be really hard to not invest in Advanced Bloodline. Yeah. All right. Well, the next level six feat is called Diverting Vortex. It's one action, and the requirements are your most recent action was to cast a non-cantrip spell. You transfer visages of magical energy to the air around you, creating a vortex that deflects range attacks. Until the start of your next turn, you gain a plus one status bonus to AC against range weapon attacks and physical range unarmed attacks. So it's it's kind of like casting shield to an extent. To an extent, although shield's more of a damage mitigation. I wonder what is a physical ranged unarmed attack. What is that? 
Is that because you? I, I kind of want punch is not a range. Yeah, I kind of want to say maybe it's like a monk's um, one of the monks' uh, special martial arts, which is kind of like you know, air bending, like the air, that air punch thing. I forgot what it's called. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe like. That kind of makes sense, but I want to see that's just a range of... D well, hey, whatever. Either way. Maybe I mean, maybe it's a spell. No, because it would say a ranged spell attack. That's yeah. weird. I, I, I still say this versus the advanced bloodline. I'm still taking the advanced bloodline. Yeah. I'm really curious about these other level 6s because I really have to see... Now, obviously, if you hit level 8, you can go back and take a level 6 uh, feat if yeah. you don't like level 8s, so forth and so on. Energetic resonance. This is the next one. This is a trigger. Uh, I'm sorry, a reaction. What the trigger is, you would take acid, cold, electricity, fire, or sonic damage from a spell. Requirements is that you have to have an unexpended spell slot, a level equal to or higher than whatever spell is triggering this. Your blood resonates with magical energy, mitigating the effects of harmful spells. Expend one of your spell slots at a level equal to or higher than that of the triggering spell. You gain resistance to one of the triggering effects damage types equal to twice the expended spell slots. Okay, okay, okay. This is this is interesting. I don't know if it's better, but it's interesting. Um, because first of all, you're learning potentially what the level of the spell is being cast at you. Mm -hmm. So you kind of get to see behind the veil a little bit because your GM has to tell you Otherwise, it doesn't work, right? Yeah. And number two, the fact that it can give you, let's just say, up to uh, 20 resistance. Not not too bad. Not, not too, too bad. Not too shabby. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, next feat is called Spell Relay, which is a reaction. The trigger is an ally casts a spell and you are within that spell's range. You open the power in your blood to your ally's spell casting, using your magic to boost their range. Your ally can use you as a point of origin for their spell, calculating range, and cover your space instead of their own. So, that's just cool. Yeah, essentially, <laughs> you're a, okay, essentially, follow me this, follow with me, essentially, <laughs> you're a Wi-Fi extender. Yep. Yep. <laughs> You, I mean, I don't know if this is better than what your advanced bloodline power is going to be, but this is just such a fun, cool ability. Uh, I, I think this is amazing. This is also really cool, too, because I believe, see, and how I cast a spell, and you are within that spell's range. You could, in theory, like, if, if, like, a sorcerer does level three heal, or three action heal, they couldn't, no, because it bursts from, the, hmm. I think I still think. I think that did. still works. Yeah, I think it still yeah. works. You could, in theory, as the sorcerer, grab that spell in midair, like have it move through your body, and then come out from you physically. So now yeah. you're the source of the level of the three action heal. Or and say, not the... or say that um, your spellcaster is super squishy, has to stay in the you know back lines because they say they're down to one HP, but mm -hmm. it's a clutch moment. And your sorcerer is kind of near the thick of things. Cast fireball through them. Oh my god, yeah. Especially if they're like uh, a fiend, or mm -hmm. uh, not fiend, a tiefling, or an ifriti, and they're or, gonna have resistance yeah. that fire. Yeah, or elemental even. Mm -hmm. um, steady spell casting is next. Uh, confident in your technique, you don't easily lose your concentration when you cast a spell. If a reaction would disrupt your spellcasting action, attempt a DC 15 flat check. If you succeed, your action isn't disrupted. This is nice, but it's also really hard. Mm. You have a 15 up chance of succeeding, which means you have a 14 down chance of failing. Yeah. It is very difficult to rely upon this, and I would honestly rather this system be changed to a concentration check, but I guess that the problem, excuse me, is that you have to roll to hit a DC. Risk and, versus reward. Yeah, well, because I'm looking at, like, I can see a pro and a con to this. The pro is that you are completely self-sufficient in this role. 
you're not taking some crazy number from a damage hit or whatever, trying to math that out and rolling to see if you can hit this crazy arbitrary DC. It is a flat check that you have agency over. Mm -hmm. However, because of that, the spectrum for success is very narrow. Yeah. All right. We are now in our level eight feats. And let's kick it off with Bloodline Resistance. Your magical blood makes you more resistant to magic. You gain a plus one status bonus to saving throws against spells and magical effects. This is good. A yeah. straight up plus one bonus to saving throws against all spells. Now, magical effects makes me wonder. Um, things like a dragon's fire breath. Um, GM discretion, and yeah. if I was a GM, I allow it. I could see that, because I know, I know that there are innate spells, which kind of function as spell-like abilities from Pathfinder 1E. Mm. Um, so I'm really curious how, like, a Dragon's Breath, that's, like, an innate spell or an innate ability, mm -hmm. or that's just a power they have, and it's in no way related to spells. So I think, I think yeah, you'd probably have to ask your GM how they would rule that, and I'm sure someone in the chat's going to absolutely hit me up with the correction, and I look mm -hmm. forward to that. Uh, next up, we have... I don't know, known yet. Okay. Uh, next up, we have cross-blooded evolution. Oh, oh boy. Okay. Odd interactions in your bloodline provide you with unexpected spells. You can have one spell in your spell repertoire from a t from a tradition, other than the one that matches your bloodline. You cast that spell as a spell from your bloodline's tradition. You can swap which spell you add and from which tradition, as you could any other source or spell, but you can't have more than one from another tradition in your spell repertoire of the same time using this feat. And here's why this is delicious. Let's say you want to be a blaster caster and you're going the old elemental route because you just want to throw dice like some drunk in Vegas. <laughs> D6. But you want to still have those hag permanent spells that just mm. ruin people's days. Yeah. You can take this feat at level 8, and whatever other bloodline you are playing, you can just go, excuse me, Hag, I'm just going to take this, thank you, and get their spells that have permanent effects affixed to it, and then take the glory of the Hag. It's yeah. so good. Or if you're the Hag, and say, um, you want to you wanna be more, uh, have a little bit more utility with your party, grab the heal spell. Yeah, or um, if you're like, man, this crowd control and this, this narrative permanency is great, but I really just need to kill something sometimes. Like, there's a boss fight, and I just need to destroy them. Dip into the, um, the elemental bloodline. Take one of their uh, amazing, like, fireball or yeah. whatever spells. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely good. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, our next level 8 feat is called Safeguarded Spell, One Action, you bring the magical wavelengths of your spell into sync with the ones produced by your own body. If the next action you take is to cast a spell with an area, you aren't affected by the spell, even if you are within the area. Oh, nice. So you're now just a, a, a walking fireball point of origin. Yeah. <laughs> you just, it's just basically, okay, casting fireball, casting it at my feet. Yep. Safeguarding myself with one action as a meta magic, I just it's that it's like that guy from uh, uh, Watchmen. Uh, uh, I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me. Yeah. Fireball. Or oh man, or um, or honestly, kind of like a Pokemon, earthquake. God, yeah. Which always made me so mad when my Garchomp was g digging and then somebody used earthquake and just kill him. Because it would do double damage because he was... Mm -hmm. Oh, so mad. Yeah. Uh, why don't you take us the next one called Soul Sight? Soul Sight. Prerequisites, Sorcerer, Bloodline that grants divine or occult spells. You must have opened your senses to the world... I'm sorry. Your muse has opened your senses to the world beyond. You gain spirit sense as an imprecise sense with a range of 60 feet. Spirit Sense enables you to sense the spirits of creatures, including living creatures, most non-mindless undead, and haunts within the listed range. 
As with your hearing and other imprecise senses, you still need to seek to locate an undetected creature. As spirit sense detects spiritual essence, not physical bodies, it can detect spirit projection by spells such as project image or possessing otherwise soulless objects. It can't detect soulless bodies, constructs, or objects. And like most senses, it doesn't penetrate through solid objects. This is amazing. PJ, PJ, PJ. Yeah. I see dead people. <laughs> dead people are like, hey, we have feelings too. It's either that or the frighteners. I... But this is awesome because this is an imprecise 60 foot uh, range, which is massive. Most imprecises start and kind of end around 30. Mm -hmm. So it's double that, not to mention this allows you to see haunts, which are undead traps, essentially. Um, uh, non mindless undead, so you know, vampires mm -hmm. and wraiths and ghosts. Um, it lets you see living creatures as well, maybe even nature spirits. Like, this yeah. is like. Daredevil Ghost Rider brain combined. Like, mm. this is amazing. Yeah. All right. Um, our next feat is we're getting to the level 10 feats Ancestral Mage. Uh, the prereq for this is Ancestral Blood Magic. And the magic of your ancestry and bloodline are one and the same. Add any innate spells you have from a heritage or an ancestry feat to your repertoire, meaning you could cast them using your spell slots. So this is interesting because most like ancestry um, spells that you get, I want to say, um, oh gosh, I was just looking at these. They kind of give you, oh God, that knowledge. But this is interesting because like, instead of having it be like a one-off, you can now have this spell like within your spell repertoire for a day. So it's not like, oh, I'm just gonna cast a spell once a day. And then it's done. Oh, man, I really wish I had that spell all the time. Mm -hmm. No, now you can cast this as many times as you have spell slots. Yeah. It's, it's a very useful ability. It's, it really depends on the spell, obviously, that you're getting from mm -hmm. your ancestry. But the fact that you're... Oh, a great example. Remember the Beastkin? Remember when we talked about how they got that ability that basically gave them Moon Frenzy? Yeah. You're no longer casting Moon Frenzy once a day, but you can now cast it as many times as you have spell slots. Mm -hmm. If you don't already know it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh. All right. So Next up, we have uh, something called Ener Energy Fusion. You want to take this one? Of course. Energy Fusion. One action metamagic feat. You fuse two spells together, combining their energy types. If the next action you use is to cast a spell that deals acid, cold, electricity, fire, or sonic, select a non-cantrip spell in your spell repertoire that deals a different type of energy damage from that list and expend an additional spell slot of the same level as this secondary spell. The spell you cast deals additional damage equal to the level of the secondary spell slot expended. The spell's total damage is divided evenly between the energy types of the spell you cast and the energy type of the second spell. This is kind of weird, but it has a very good use. Um, a, it's bonus damage. Mm -hmm. Not a ton of bonus damage, depending on the spell slot you're sacrificing, but it still gives you a flat bonus damage. On top of that, it allows you to attack with two energy types. And more to the point, instead of that bonus 1, 2, 3, 4, 10 that you're dealing being the secondary type, it's taking the total number, the plus for the slot and the plus for the dice, that total number that you roll, and splitting that up into two numbers of the two damage types. And this is important for weaknesses, resistances, immunities, and DR this is the way you kind of cheat around those defenses or abuse weaknesses. Yeah. And also, do you know what I thought when I saw, heard the title of that uh, feat? What's Pen. That? Apple. Pen apple. Oh, God. <laughs> pineapple. Uh, pineapple apple pen? Yeah. Pineapple apple pen. I'll be here all night, folks. <laughs> But anyway, um, our next uh, level 10 feat is called Energy Ward. This is a free action. 
frequency once per turn, requirements, your most recent action was to cast a non-cantric spell that dealt, that deals, uh, that dealt, past tense, dealt energy damage. You trap energy from the last spell you cast within your body, coating your flesh in a protective ward. Until the start of your next turn, you gain resistance 5 to one type of energy type uh, dealt by the spell you just cast. So essentially, if you cast that fireball, you get a resistance of fire, I believe, 5. Looks like, yeah, you trap energy from the last spell you cast within your body, coating your flesh protective ward. Yeah, yeah. But now I wonder if this goes to things that are non-elemental. So like I, if you do something that does mental damage, does that protect you against mental damage? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's that's kind I of the vibe so. I'm getting. Yeah. And abjuration, well, I guess abjuration would just be force damage? Yeah, probably. Uh, well, greater bloodline. Uh, this is basically like the advanced bloodline. This is where you get your final bloodline spell. Uh, well, your bloodline power, I should say. Uh, level 10, bloodline spell. Further communion with the legacy or bloodline has uncovered greater secrets. You gain the greater bloodline spell associated with your bloodline. Increase the number of focus points in your focus pool by one. Now, here's what's interesting about the prereqs. You only have to have access to the bloodline spell, which you get for free, I think, uh, first level. Mm -hmm. I want to say. Yeah. Uh, I might correct myself in a bit. But either way, the point is, the real point I'm making, you don't have to get the level six bloodline power mm -hmm. to get this. So if you don't like the level six one, which, you know, you're entitled to not want that. Um, the other level sixes are okay. I don't know if they're better. But that's, again, that's a choice. Mm -hmm. No matter what, you can still get your final and more powerful, your, your most powerful bloodline power at level 10 with this feat. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. I like that. All right. Our next feat at level 10 is called Overwhelming Energy. One action. You alter your spells to overcome resistances. If the next action you use is to cast a spell, the spell ignores an amount of targets resistance to acid, cold, electricity, fire, or sonic damage equal to your level. This applies to all damage the spell, the spell does, and uh, including persistent damage and damage caused by ongoing effects of the spell, such as a wall created by wall fire. A creature's immunities are unaffected. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. So I, it's a lot like Energy Ward, but it's a more, reverse. Yeah. Overcome resistances, yeah. yeah. So if they have resistances, you can overcome those mm -hmm. by by basically making this metamagic feat more uh, uh, stubborn, I guess. Yeah. Or hotter than hot. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so let's see, that was overwhelming energy. Quickened casting. Casting. Nah. This is a free action meta magic feat. This is fun. Um, if your next action is to cast a cantrip or a spell that is at least two levels lower than the highest spell slot you have, reduce the number of actions cast uh, by it by one. Special. This can only be used on a cantrip or a spell from the class matching the one you gained this feat from. Um, so effectively as a sorcerer, if you have a second level or lower spell or a cantrip, you can basically do that as a one action cast. Um, this is a great way to stack spells, to uh, basically cast, run, and maybe do another action. This gives you more options. Uh, I'm, I don't like that it's only limited to second level spells, but I can see why they do that as a balancing feature. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Uh, all right, our next level 10 feat is called Signature Spell Expansion. Your innate connection to magic lets you cast more spells with greater freedom. You gain two additional signature spells, each of which must have a minimum level of three or lower. I like this. This I like because um, Signature Spells basically allows you to just heighten for free, and also you can you can basically downcast at your le leisure. Yeah, and and even if you have something like that um, that doesn't up upscale, right? Mm -hmm. Let me see. I'm wondering if this is a, a second or a third. 
Oh, there's so many spells in the arcane spell list. Why did I do this to myself? Uh, is there a third level spell? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, so let's say you want to make haste your signature spell. I don't believe haste really upscales. Yeah, like seventh level, you can target up to six creatures. You're probably not going to really... Yeah, a whole buff, a whole haste of team is great, but you don't really need that, right? So you can just, as a signature spell, plug and play haste. It doesn't, you don't have to worry about losing power on, on the inability to break past third level scaling. You still have a really awesome buff spell that's really good at the level it's at. And you can just use that oof, to your heart's yeah. content. Yeah. All right. Um, why don't you take a blood component substitution? Okay, this is a level 12 feat. You can bypass the need for incantations and gestures by drawing energy directly from your blood, causing you to visibly glow the color of your blood and crackle with magical energy. That is metal as F. Yeah. I love that description. Mm -hmm. When you cast a spell, you can replace all verbal, material, or somatic spell casting components with a blood component. To use a blood component, you lose hit points equal to twice the spell's level as the energy uh, in your blood, as the energy in your blood is depleted, there you go, and you can't decrease the hit points lost in any way, so no resistances, no nothing. Uh, as usual for altering components, this has no effect on the number of actions required to cast the spell, and your cast a spell activity gains the concentrate trait, but not the manipulate trait. You can't use blood components to replace any required part of a spell's cost. I have mixed feelings on this feat um, because I feel like what they've tried to do here was grant something the sorcerer has always traditionally done um, or can kind of do, but on a slightly larger scale. But the balancing factor of damaging yourself in the process makes me worry. Like, yeah, if you're way in the back and never targeted, then this is just kind of like whatever. But yeah. I don't know. And the concentration trait it, does kind of become problematic. Yeah, honestly, it, at least to me, it sounds more for aesthetic purposes. If you really want to play, like, a blood mage, this mm -hmm. is where to go. But, um... Yeah, eh. It's, I'll say this, I don't hate it. There's absolutely a purpose for this. Uh, it's, it's definitely an F you pay me skill. It is yeah. absolutely an F you pay me skill. Yeah. I, uh, I hesitate at the cost, but mm -hmm. if you're willing to pay that price, Wait, why not? PJ, can you off, uh, I'm wondering if you could offset this by using temporary hit points or no. No, it's, no, it's yeah. directly from your HP and there's no okay. defenses to it. Okay. I mean, I would have said, uh, yeah, if it was, if you could use uh, temporary HP to offset it, it, it could be useful. I could see, I could see use for it then there. But anyway, um, our next level 12 feat is called Bloodline Focus. Prereq is a Bloodline spell. You, your focus recovers faster. You, if you spend at least uh, two focus points since the last time you refocus, you recover two focus points when you refocus instead of one, which is very useful when you're doing some time management. Uh, yeah, just spend two focus points and boom, you get two back. Yeah, it definitely makes the time economy better. For that, for that one 10 minute usage of refocusing, you get two points back. So you only need 10 minutes instead of having to take potential 20 plus mm -hmm. minutes to get those points yeah. back. All right. Greater physical evolution. Uh, flex. Now, for this one, you have to... <laughs> oh, God. For, to get greater physical evolution, the prerequisites are arcane or primal evolutions. You hold a deep understanding of the innate fundamental structures of the physical world, and you can enforce your will upon that structure as far as your own blood is concerned. Once per day, you can use a sorcerer spell slot to cast any common polymorph battle form spell of the spell slots level as if it were a signature spell in your repertoire. If you have arcane evolution, uh, you can also choose from any battle form spell in your spell book. If you have primal evolution, you can also cast a spell listed in that feat using the extra spell slots 
that the feat grants. So basically this is a, a free transformation spell mm -hmm. to you or an ally. And if you do the arcane evolution, uh, you get more than just a polymorph. You can get literally any battle yeah. form spell, um, which guy could also maybe, no, nah, I think moon frenzy is primal. Either way could also be effective. Oh, like enlarge, enlarge person. Mm -hmm. Um, Primal Evolution basically just gives you that free access to, um, besides this polymorph, things like the call animals and the call plants and fungi, if I'm reading this right. Mm -hmm. uh, still, solid free magic, free bonus magic, growing your already invested feet tree. Not a bad way to go. Yeah. All right. Our next level 12 feet is called Greater Spiritual Evolution. Prereq for this one is divine evolution or occult evolution your magical blood is rich with spiritual es essence and this infusion within you allows your spells to be fully effective against incorporeal creatures spirits and creatures on the ethereal plane your spells have the effects of a ghost touch property room they could target or affect the creature projecting its consciousness such as via project image or possessing another creature even if its body is elsewhere Though you must know about the possession or projection and choose to do so. Your spells can also affect creatures on the ethereal plane, though this doesn't grant you any particular ability to locate them. This is this is still really good. Yeah. I mean think about it. If you're fighting a ghost and you're having a hard time getting your spells to get through whatever uh corp incorporeal bonuses they're having, this negates that. You have a ghost touch on like chill touch. That probably wouldn't work as what well. Divine Lance. Either way, it, that's an F you pay me skill. Nope, sorry, Ghost. I'm hurting you. End of day. But also, what's more important is that so long as you're aware that someone is being possessed or that someone is projecting an image via the cantrip or whatever spell, you can attack the person directly responsible. You don't have to know where they are. You just have to know that yeah. this comes from a source, and you get to attack that source direct that is what's cool yeah and honestly attacking uh incorporeal creatures always have been a pain always a pain because it's such um what's the word i'm looking for um a pacific uh kind of uh instance it's not something you yeah. do that comes around every day but when it does and you don't have something like ghost touch it could be a pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, absolutely is a pain. And if your GM is playing this whole like, muhaha, like you're being affected by like this remote mastermind type. Well, now you can just go attack the mastermind directly by extension of either knowing that this person is possessed by them or just by attacking mm. the, the illusion that they release. That is so good. Yeah. Um, next up, the level 12 feet. So I think this might even be the last level five. I'm sorry, level 12 feet. Yeah, it is. Um, and we may call this one the last one for the day because it's about getting that time. Okay. Magic Sense. Level five, uh, level, tw level 12 feet. Why do I keep saying that? You have a literal sixth sense for ambient magic in your vicinity. You can sense the presence of magic auras as though you're always using the Detect Magic cantrip. This detects magic in your field of vision only. When you seek, you gain the benefit of a third level detect magic cantrip on things that you see in addition to the normal benefits of seeking. You can turn this sense off and on with a free action at the start or end of your turn. Special, this feat has the trait corresponding to the tradition of spells you cast, arcane, divine, natural, or cold. So technically we'll be counting as that kind of feat. Now, this is a really cool feat. I do like this. Mm -hmm. However, comma, if you have a naturally high arcana skill, which you probably end up will, will have that, um, there's a skill feat for the arcana skills that give this exact same thing. I, so yeah. I feel like as cool as this is, you can also get the exact same thing at level three. Yeah, I believe it's called Arcane Sight. Yes, uh, it is called Arcane, arcane Sense. Sense, uh. And it's a level one, excuse me, it's a level yeah. one feat that does the exact same thing. The only difference is, is that this, the Arcane Sense, being a level one skill feat, levels up with you. Mm -hmm. So you won't get everything out the gate, but 
by the time your skills would match your level 12, this would be about the same yeah. efficacy, and you're yeah. not using level 12 character feed for it. Yeah, like, uh, what is it? I'm just going to read from the description of Arcane Sense. If you're mm -hmm. a master in Arcana, the spell's heightened to 3rd level, and if you're legendary, it's heightened to 4th level. Yeah. And, and you got to look at this. You're getting skill upgrades every two levels mm -hmm. after two. No, after three. Um, so it's like five, seven, nine, mm -hmm. eleven, blah, 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 blah. And after level seven, you can become a master in a skill. So in theory, around level seven or nine, you can get Arcane Sense with at least a third level heightened feature yeah. that, you know, is permanent as opposed to taking this level 12 feet where you have to have you have to force yourself to seek to get that third level benefit yeah arcane honestly arcane sense is just so such a better route to go honestly yeah and and this is not saying magic sense is bad it's it's good however my recommendation to any level 12 sorcerer when picking your feats is if you haven't already if you want this ability there's there's another route you can get to it that may be more economic and at level 12 instead highly recommend um you know bloodline focus for your bloodline powers or one of the greater evolutions because those evolution skill feats yeah. are or feat trees are pretty good and they're really going to boost good. your bottom line power mm -hmm. yeah. yeah all right well that has been the level 12 feats uh so far pj mm -hmm. what has uh what has really caught your eye on this episode well i'm a big fan of divine spell lists and divine classes divine powers so the divine bloodline did not disappoint way back when we did bloodlines and the divine bloodline feats did not disappoint either giving you a free spell slot i believe of your highest spell level for a either a heal or a harm mm. is really good um, and not to mention all the spiritual evolutions, attacking people remotely through their stuff. Cool flavor, cool mechanic, the divine all the way. Uh, for me, it would be a toss-up between actually two level one feats, uh, Counterspell and Reach Spell. The Sorcerer's version of Counterspell, so much better than, uh, than the Wizards or the Witches. And Counterspell could be so, so useful. Um, I have found more than one use for it whenever I played a spellcaster back in the day. Uh, then also reach spells. I just like reach spells because it could turn a typical touch spell into a, you know, a range spell. It's so useful there too. It, absolutely. I mean, if for nothing else, and if you are using the heal spell or even the harm spell, and you want to use that second action, uh, two action cast, like pumped up version of it, Using that at a 30-foot range is going to keep your butt out of harm's way yeah. in a major way. That, is, that alone is worth it. Mm -hmm. um, I, like, I like the spell relay fluff. I think it's such a cool thing. I don't know if that's the level 6 feat I would choose, mm -hmm. but it for sure is a fun one. It's yeah. very fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Reap Psyche posted, PJ is a goody two-shoes holy boy. I'm, I mean, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm playing a level 15 Magus, and I was like, I either have to multi-class into Barbarian or Champion, and I took, I took Champion. Good boy. Wait, good boy. <laughs> Bad boy. Bad boy. <laughs> we need a t-shirt like this. Like basically, it's you as a good boy, me as a bad boy. Do like a split down the middle. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, also, the reason why I didn't take Barbarian, because I think it would have been more powerful and more fun to play a Barbarian Magus, is because the Rage is a concentration trait, mm, uh, and I yeah. cannot use anything with the concentration trait while raging. Mm -hmm. And there's that feat, Moment of Clarity, which allows me to do that, but only for this turn. So in mm -hmm. theory, it would be very hard to rage um, and spell strike and yeah. attack on the same turn still. It, would, it was just a headache, yeah. so... But anyway, um, I believe it is that time, right, PJ? It is absolutely that time. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to part three of The Sorcerer. When we come back for the next week, we are going to finish uh, level 14 to 20, so just six more levels of feats, uh, and we'll probably have time for a build. Uh, but without further ado, uh, again, let us know if you like this 
this new deeper system, taking more time, do more episodes, and let us know if you have any other classes you want to see us uh, talk about. If you want to join us in the discussion, please hit us up. Uh, there's other TTRPG subjects like role play and et cetera. Uh, and Mr. Michael Powell, why don't you tell them who you are and where they can find you on that sweet, sweet internet? Well, I am the dastardly, dashing Michael Powell. You can find me all over the internet on my social medias, which is at Mr. Kapow, that's M-R-K-A-P-A-O, or my Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Michael Powell Does Stuff, because I do a lot of stuff, like my YouTube channel called Fantastic Tales of Adventure. That's really fun. And um, I believe on Thursdays, uh, I'm on uh, Toyzilla Network here on Twitch at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I host a show called Toyzilla Live, where I talk about, uh, you know, new toy news and nostalgia stuff. It's a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. And how about you, PJ? Oh, my name is PJ McGaw. You can find me all over the internet at pj.mcgaw. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Come find me. Friend me. Let's have a good time. Um, when I'm out here with Michael on Tuesdays, you can also find uh, he and I, as well as Sydney and Kylie and Sam and Ian, on our Wednesday show, Edge of Legend, the Pathfinder 2nd Edition homebrew show, uh, as we kick off into the second day of Tredes Maximo Lucha. By the way, I put a poll uh, you can vote on now or Wednesday, sooner the better, to see which one of the Lucha Warriors that didn't make it out of the 30-man Battle Royale gets a second chance with the lottery drawing to get the, the eighth spot for the weekend of competition. So if there was a character you liked that maybe got eliminated a little too early, go ahead and check out the list. Four names are there, um, and we'll see where the story takes us. Uh, so once again, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Edge of Legends, awesome Lucha story that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I got and... another mask. I still have one more mask to debut tomorrow. <laughs> oh, you got a new mask. Ooh, new mask. I can't wait to see well, it's it. it's not new mask, but it's a mask that you guys haven't seen yet. Well, if I haven't seen it, it's new to me. All right. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's going to be some more announcements down the road. I think we're going to have one Wednesday night, and then again in July, I'll be doing the Jasper's Game Day. Reap Psyche in the chat uh, was able to win a raffle ticket to join us in that game. So uh, if you want to come out to support that, we'll give you more details along the way. And I will see you same nat time, same nat channel here at the table. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.